When Francis T. Nichols Junior College opened in 1948, Thibodeau was a sleepy little town. Then, at 6 p.m. on Saturday, February 19, 1972, KFBG Science on the Air, broadcasting from the campus of Nichols State University in Tipito, Louisiana. This is Paul Cook, station manager of KVFG. Before Paul Cook and company took over the airways, there was already a campus radio station. Sort of. Believe it or not, we had a broadcast facility in a closet, in the janitor's closet is what it was. Somehow they had a, that wire, and I guess it probably ran up into the ceiling and then across, and uh, probably through an opening in the building somewhere, and then across uh, the open area to uh, the student union. We piped music from that single little wire from Pelche Hall into just, just into the little bitty speakers that you have, okay? And that's how it started. It was called a KNSU. Paul Cook arrived on campus with radio experience and was driven. He knew KNSU could be something special. So he walked into the station and introduced himself. Told him I'm Paul Cook and I'm the new general manager. <laughs> Everybody went, oh, okay. Paul's first move as self-appointed station manager was to make Greg Dumas his second in command. Paul came to me one day and said, hey, we're going to put this, we're going to make an FM station out of this, which was unheard of at the time. Paul had big dreams, but things were not so easy. It came back, we found out that we had to fool with the Federal Communications Commission, but who owned, who owned Nickel State University? the state of Louisiana, and the state legislature had to okay us, so we had to go to the state legislature. Paul and Greg wanted to keep the KNSU call letters, but were denied by the FCC. KNSU was already taken by a Coast Guard weather ship. The FCC told them to submit other options. Paul Cook was one of them. I was one of them, Dumas, Greg Dumas, and then Vernon F. Galliano was one. Now you got it, okay? But anyway, and, uh, and Fred Fry, who was, our, who was our teacher, our professor at the time. So we put the call letters in, and we asked for KCDF, KFDC, K, all, of our, all of our last letters, in our, in, and then the last one we put in was KVFG. And don't you know, they picked out KVFG. Paul and Gray got everything done. All that was left was to wait. The spring of uh, 72, we had everything in place, and we were just waiting on the commission to say okay. And uh, we, when we received that, uh, it came in the form, I think, of a telegram, and we made the announcement that KNSU was now on the air. They could pick it up there in the student union, in the cafeteria. Uh, people could pick it up on their radios, now that Nickel State had a radio station, what would the sound be? We didn't just play uh, a standard format. We let the DJs pick what they wanted. Or the format back then was more not eclectic. It was more uh, a we, we called it AOR, album oriented rock. Okay, and and back then, you know, you're talking the, the Doobie Brothers, rock and roll, and and some pop music but mostly, um, you know, middle of the road. Um, it wasn't quite top 40. There was uh, some songs that didn't fit within the top 40. The, the real weird stuff was, was selected for at late night, you know? <laughs> and then we would do some radio dramas uh, late at night, you know, after midnight. The equipment in the station at the time was, well, basic. It was two turntables and a microphone, a small board, and we played uh, LPs, you know, that was pretty much the, uh, the long and the short of it. We did have a two track um, uh, cassette player. Uh, there was one studio. And uh, if, if, if we were live on the air in the main studio and somebody wanted to be recording something elsewhere, we had to put pillows around the doors and make sure that, uh, that the sound was protected. 
but we didn't know from sophisticated stuff. We were, you know, we were playing it by ear and, by the way, having a great time as we were doing it. It was not long before the community started to pay attention to KVFG. We were in a championship game one time, and I don't know who it was. It was basketball, and the whole the whole region was excited about it. And we had half a Thibodeau listening to us, and we didn't even know it because we were the only station to carry it. With that game, everybody in Thibodeau uh, and Shriver and and uh, in the small area that we covered knew that we were on the air. KVFG also covered important national events such as Watergate, and they did it in French. I said, why not get Dr. Rathley into the studio at least once an hour a day? We have French-speaking people in, this, in our communities, okay? And have him translate what's going on in the Watergate hearings at a prime time when, when something's happening, have asked him if he'd come in, and he did. He came into the KVFG studios, and he'd sit and listen to what they were saying in English, and then he would, trans, he would transcribe it and, and put it in French over, the K, over KVFG, which really helped our, our ratings. Keeping the station student-run was Paul's design from the beginning. Uh, Greg was my assistant manager all of that time. Uh, and I basically said, it's yours, Greg. <laughs> I didn't go through anybody else. <laughs> and I think that's what Greg was going to do. But I think that's the th way to do it, is actually, uh, if you've got uh, students that are brought up by students who are brought up by people in the business, uh, you turn out students who are ready to do the job. KVFG was doing great things, but they were still a college radio station. You know, a typical um, student station where people are learning and uh, making mistakes. Many times we would go off the air because we couldn't fill the board shift. You know, the guy who was on at 10 o'clock in the morning said, I got to go be in my economics class. And so uh, we're going to sign off now, but uh, tune in at 2 o'clock when the next guy comes on. And we didn't do it like normal radio stations do it, where, you know, it's um, like 6 to 10, 10 to 1. Oh, no, I mean, it was whenever we could get there. I remember one guy did a show, and he flipped all of the buttons until the last button that he was supposed to flip, which would make the station go out over the airwaves. And so he did a four-hour show strictly to himself. And there was always that one crazy DJ. Jerry Lusto, I think, was the one that was crawling up there to do a broadcast from on the top of the tower, which I would have to say maybe have been 100 feet high. I believe that was Jerry Lusto, and I believe he dressed as in a bunny costume. It was hard to keep him off the tower once he did that. When breaking news happened, John Weimer was there to cover it. Uh, somebody came rushing in to the radio station and advised me while I was on the air. And so I broke into the song and kind of went into the DJ voice and announced a major development on campus uh, sufficient to justify interrupting the music and explain that Nichols was now on the map with its first streaker. And uh, the phone kind of lit up, people were calling in, wanting to know, you know where this individual was and where he had uh, struck, so to speak. And I made a call out to uh, invite the individual to come on the radio station to be interviewed. And sure enough, uh, before my shift ended, this guy came in and uh, he was clothed, thank God, but he did have his head covered still. And so I began interviewing him. And during the middle of the interview, campus police show up to uh, take him into custody for his uh, nefarious activity. And there were interviews with famous celebrities. And today I'm here with, uh, with uh, a great uh, a musician and artist, uh, Charlie Daniels. Hi, Charlie. Welcome to Thibodeau. Well, thanks a lot, man. It's really, it's really good being here. <laughs> Charlie, where, when are you, where, where are you going next? <laughs> it's filled with that. We're not putting that on the air. <laughs> the guy was really upset. People came and went, but KVFG's format remained the same.
our format was kind of like all over the place. You want to do a shift? What do you want to play? <laughs> you can bring your own music if you want. And that's kind of how it was. We had country, we had the best of Britain, we had um, rock and roll, alternative music. We had a little bit of everything and it was great. And there was also dead air. I mean, people just wouldn't show up. The other person would just leave and put on an album. And say, well, I'll put on an album. Somebody will show up before the end of the album. And then you turn on the station and it's like, dead air and we didn't have cell phones back then so you'd have to get the phone call about it and i picked up a lot of shifts kvfg continued to bring important news to the nichols community so the presidential election was huge on campus they had um they had uh, student union uh, rallies and things like that that was uh, we covered that quite a bit um people would get up on their little podium and and talk about their candidates and um boos and hisses and that kind of thing, so that was big. But the, um, the Iran um, hostage situation was kind of scary. We kind of talked about it. Um, we were aware of it. Uh, everyone had that fear of war. In 1985, KVFG became KNSU. Joe Broussard, I believe, that finally traced, uh, you know, the station. So he wrote, wrote a letter to somebody at the Coast Guard explained the situation, asked them if we could have the call sign, and they said, yeah, fill out the paperwork, and it's yours. Looking back, I don't know that a lot of people knew what the whole KVFG stood for. I didn't know when I, when I, when I first came to work at the station, KVFG, and I, I, it, it was a while before somebody told me, no, that was Vernon F. Galliano. I'm like, we named, we named the station after the, that's kind of sweet, all right. But it just became what it was, right? It didn't really, KVFG doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but. It got us media attention on campus. It gave us a reason to be out there and to, to make a new logo, to, to make shirts, make bumper stickers, to put ourselves out there. And they continued reporting the news. The first time I heard about the space shuttle, I was I was actually walking into Bob Blazer's classroom and uh, they had CNN on and CNN, I think, was the only one covering it. And we were, they were just standing there. We, we looked at it and like holy crap the first thing i wanted to do was i picked up the phone and called the station and it was like okay i gotta let these guys know i, I just happened to be in the station uh one one day uh middle of the afternoon and it was juan juan simino i believe was our manager at the time um was in the student union and i guess they had the uh the tvs on and i'm sitting at my desk and the phone rang he rang i guess he called me direct you might have known i was there and I answered the phone, and as I answered the phone, the AP machine, the news machine, started making noises that it had never. Ma I, I didn't know. I didn't know it had bells. It was just. It was just that. It was just. Ever since I've been there, it's just been this little hum and printing, and it starts going crazy. And and as I'm talking to Juan, he said, uh, "The space shuttle just blew up." A lot happened during the first 14 years of KVFG KNSU, but the facilities mostly remained the same. It was it was this dingy place? I mean, just these these beige, institutional beige walls and the desks were all kind of crammed up and albums everywhere. These big, these just walls and walls of, of records and albums. The desk, some of the desks in this building today, we unboxed. Those were, <laughs> they're covered in stickers now, but those were, those multicolored desks, that was Joe Broussard, E. Joe Broussard, good guy, but we joked about it being the Partridge family. That was, uh, so it's, so it's sort of good to see that, that's good furniture, by the way, whoever, they, whoever made that, those, that, that, those desks, they're still here. The 80s brought new types of music, and KNSU was at the forefront. I think over time I probably went more from classic rock music and then to what we called new wave uh, back in the, you know, the, the early MTV days. Uh, there, were, there were folks that came on and played lots of new age and new wave stuff, and I was like, well, okay, that's, that's not really my cup of tea, but... That's something interesting too, and and then there was jazz and also Christian rock show early on, uh, which I didn't even know until I got there that there was such a thing as Christian rock. We tried to break music before it came on the radio. We tried to be the ones saying, okay, we we got a new album from let's say John Waite. We were playing Missing You before anybody else played Missing You. DJs would come in and probably just put on a show for their five friends they had listening. Lillian Axe was a local metal band that. Uh, you know, weren't, they weren't going to get radio time anywhere, but there were a lot of folks that loved that music. I, I guess our music format matched those multicolored discs. <laughs> it was all over the place. The 80s were the golden age of college radio. KNSU invited everyone to the party.
Delirious Dave Martin had a show on Monday nights, and it was probably one of the most popular shows on campus. It was the you know, the uh, dedication party, and he would do things like get all of the, the dorms to put you know, all of the students in the dorms to put speakers out in their windows uh, and just crank it loud all at the same time. I served time in, in long haul, but it was that big, ugly six-story, I guess, building, seven-story, whatever it was, uh, cement building, and walking on campus once, I, I thought, that looks like a speaker. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, that'd be fun. If I, could, if I could promote it and just try to turn the campus into a, a radio station. So like at 10 o'clock on Monday, what I'll do is I'll line up some songs to play, and I'm going to try to get as many people as possible to put their speakers in the window. And again, this is back when we had people. I guarantee you, you could hear them. They had dead people with speakers that probably didn't need to open the window. They were loud. And promoted it. And we got uh, the you know the girls' dorms and stuff, and and uh, I still remember that it was uh, I don't I don't know if somebody told on us or not, but I I figured the first song was going to play was Van Halen Jump. It was the the, the lead into the uh, uh, 1984 is the instrumental, and it goes into Jump. And I saw it from board, it's coming up at 10, coming up at 10, and from board, said, guys, get your speakers in the windows. Here we go at 10 o'clock. We're gonna so 10 o'clock. All right, guys, time to turn nickels into uh, to a stereo. And I, you know, dropped the needle on 1984, and I'm, and I'm in Peltier. We had no windows, so I had somebody, you know, hold the door and stuff for me. And I went running down the Peltier into the quadrangle, and it was scary. I got a little chill at the time because when I got to the quadrangle, 1984 is that synthesizer music, and I'll be dang, you could hear it. And it was just like, I mean, I could, you could hear it, and it was from the quadrangle. You could hear, wow, well, look, they're doing this, and then boom, into jump, and again, I know that sounds that jump was cool back in the day. We that jump, jump was a big song. And, uh, and I'm standing in the middle of the quadrangle just like, oh, this is amazing. And then the lights went off, man. Then it was like, uh, you know, the bubble gum machine, yeah, campus security came, uh, came in and they, some, some were going out to the dorms and yelling at people and making them shut things off. And then one came over to the campus, uh, came to the studio, caught me as I was, I was going in and I had to, as, he, I think he let me finish the song jump. I think he let me, and then I just had to say, hey guys, uh, <laughs> sorry about all that stuff I promoted all, all week, but uh, campus security says we gotta, Please shut it down. It was time for another upgrade for the technology, not the space. It was honestly a dump. Uh, we got there, and this was just when CDs were kind of starting to be, you know, affordable a little bit. Um, and we were like old, two old turntables, and basically two old turntables, a mic, and, a, and an audio board was pretty much all we had. We pay a student fee for this station. Like, where does that money go? <laughs> like, so we went to ask our advisor. Um, and uh, he's like, well, it just gets put in an account. I said, well, can we buy stuff? And he's like, yeah, go see how much you got. And we had like $17,000 in this account. And this is 1986. So we ended up, um, we bought the first CD players for KNSU, uh, two of them, like two, like the Denon, whatever the, you know, DJ model was. Um, we upgraded the audio board, got new microphones, um, kind of like set up a little production room. Um, so we were kind of like bringing us into the digital age, I guess you would say. A high school student was abandoned at the mic, but she eventually became station manager. When I was 16, a friend of mine was uh, 17 and almost 18, and he was at Nichols and he had a show. And he said, come do my radio show with me. So I went and in the middle of doing his radio show, he had a fight with his girlfriend, left the studio and left me to finish his show which I had never done before. <laughs> and uh, I basically said over the air, I don't know what I'm doing, somebody help. And someone called one of the existing DJs and talked me through it. At long last, KNSU got new digs. The actual move, well, that wasn't fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Boxing everything up and, and getting it transported and all that. Went from feeling like a corporate sort of space like very dry, not a lot of personality, almost like a classroom with a built-in uh, uh, booth for the DJs to perform, and that was it. And it was very simple. And then when it moved to Talbot Hall, the space that they got, it, it, it felt more like, a, almost like a, a, a WKRP in Cincinnati feel to it or something. It was a lot more bohemian. The new space was, it was fun. It was so shiny and, and it felt pretty special, you know, um, especially after Peltier Hall, which I have a fond memory of the multiple times we had birds in the studio and we had to chase them out. In Talbot Hall, they actually cut out part of the wall 
and had a viewing window into the DJ booth. So students walking by could actually stop and watch you DJ and watch you almost like you were in an aquarium or performing or something. New equipment, new space. What about a new format? The format wasn't set in stone. There wasn't one. Country to blues to rock to, you know, college music, uh, you know, I basically you got to pick whatever you wanted to play. The theory, the philosophy was trying to move away from um, commercial, from what people heard, you know, and really trying to embrace the college music that was exploding. I mean, this was the time of REM, of all that. Uh, no top 40. And if it was played on any kind of rotation at any other professional radio station, we weren't going to play it. We started the process of um, reporting playlists and getting free music. Up until then, we bought music, which was crazy to think of, right? Like we actually had a budget set aside for how much music we were going to buy and what albums we were going to buy, and we had discussions about it. And then um, we discovered CMJ and that we could report and talk about you know, what we wanted and talk to the promoters and say, hey, we really want this album and all that. And, it changed everything. Traffic reports became a regular thing. I think it was Bill Juno who used to ride around his bike during the morning arrival when everybody was trying to park. And he would like ride through a parking lot, then get to a, you know, like a phone in a building and say, okay, I saw three spots at this lot and I saw two spots at this one. And it was pretty funny. KNSU had trouble finding a station manager and went off the air. But the station came back more powerful than ever. Shasaw said something to me. He came there and somebody else said something to me. Man, you know, they need, they really need some help with the station. Well, it took him a couple of weeks to convince me to do it. But, you know, I went ahead and, and said, okay, I'll, I'll help you out. And I think the, then I, that's when I realized what, what was going on, you know, and they revealed to me that the license had been expired and that they needed to re-equip, get the license renewed. Uh, but the first thing I was gonna have to do was shut the station down. I'm being off the air for a while, which seemed like forever. It's, I mean, it was part of a year or so, or, or, so, or give or take, but it felt like 10 years for me. I had an engineer come in and, you know, realign everything. They had to do stuff with the tower and they had to do, you know, all kind of stuff. And we increased it to uh, 250 watts instead of the 10 watts. And so now you could hear us clear to Homa. Almost like a running thing, like, okay, we're gonna get the 250, get the 250, and, and finally we got it. You know, you could only catch the radio station once you drove off campus, or once you passed Flanagan's to the south. That was it, you couldn't hear it anymore. It was a neat feeling, like knowing that, okay, we're, we're not just hitting the campus anymore, we're, we're reaching out further. Those kids, the whole attitude really changed. When they came back and we had that, and now their friends in Holman, their friends in Morgan City could hear them. It, they were lit up. Station management did whatever it took to get KNSU back on the air and increase power. Probably me not knowing the university system and how you had to get permission first to spend money I think that's probably the only reason we got it opened in just the summer semester, I think, because I just went ahead. I didn't really know, man. I just went out and spent the money and ordered the stuff to, you know, people come in and do the work. And I, you called Bob, you know, and I was sitting there across the desk from Bob, and he's sitting there smoking a Paul Mall, you know, so he's smoking with his feet up on the desk. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, uh, yeah, he's one of my students. And then the next thing you know, and he's talking, it's like, and he was reaming Bob about me spending $65,000 without getting any approval of it. The necessary improvements to the station left the bank accounts empty. Drastic steps were needed by the new station manager. We need to do something or we're going to run out of money and not be able to fund ourselves. So, in a fit, because <laughs> you're, what was I, 19, 20 at the time? Um, I, uh, oh God, 
this is so embarrassing, but I sent a letter to all the board of trustees, each individually in the board of trustees saying, okay, there's not really a whole lot of oversight and this is what's going on. We gotta do something about this. And Dr. Ayo did not like that. I get a call when we get back to the office. Uh, there was a voicemail. Um, you need to come to the advancement office and we need to talk to you and your staff. And I was like, okay. So we all pile in the office and they're like, okay, we're gonna ask you to turn in your keys now. I'm like, oh. Okay, <laughs> so we thought we were done. And um, so then they laid out the plan. And so the plan was to close for the summer so that the self-assessment fees would just come in and take care of the budget. Before going off air for the summer, tragedy hit KNSU when station manager Patty Donnelly died in a car accident. The way I became station manager was a little unconventional because um, the station manager at the time, Patty Donnelly, was killed in a car accident. And um, that was very traumatic for anyone at that age. I mean, we were all so young, and I had dinner with her the night before. That Patty Donnelly, man, I tell you what, she, because uh, when I took that job, I didn't want to take it. And I told her, I said, you know, you got to come be the assistant manager if I do this shit. <laughs> it's like, Patty was a genuine, warm, caring person. Uh, you know, just, just uh, always, just uh, always had time for you. Always would give, give her time and give of herself, and just always uh, had a funny, uplifting word to say, and was always, uh, always just the same every time you saw her. The last conversation with her was just she was really excited about the station, and when the news hit, um, yeah, I remember talking to Richie Goodrow over there and he and I could barely keep composure. I mean, it was just, it was just horrible. KNSU commissioned research to find out how to better serve the community. We did a marketing survey and just around in the community, just what was our listenership like? Who was our typical listener? Um, Cause we had plans to un do underwriting. We needed to raise some money. One of the main things that the listeners for, to give us feedback about is that they didn't know what was going to be on the radio when they tuned in and they wanted a little more consistency. They didn't tell me that I had to play anything. I didn't have a formatted show. Uh, they were just like, go in. You want to bring a guest in the studio? Bring a guest. You want to uh, not do that? Don't do that. You want to read a book? Do it. We ended up becoming um, just a straight alternative rock uh, radio station from 6 a.m. till 2 a.m. The rock alternative was, I think, the base of all that, and that's the thing that we had the most of. I mean, obviously, that branched out into so many different subgenres. Oh, we had an 80s show, because um, we still had vinyl at that time, so we could do some 80s. Punk, ska, metal, Punk. industrial. <gasps> yeah. Dance. Electronica. TRL uh, was big on MTV, so bands like Blink-182 were gaining national prominence uh, and, and really... Uh, you know, breaking as crossover hits. This rebranding brought with it a new slogan. We needed a, a brand, a tagline. We needed a brand and, and something that would reach out. And yeah. so we tossed around some ideas and because we were rock, we were edgy, yeah. we came up with the edge. The new branding and focus of the station worked and KNSU was growing. More DJs came to the radio station um, to, to be part of it. So we were able to add more shifts and add more shows to where we were DJing on the weekend and DJing um, from 6 a.m. till midnight yeah. and then 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. So we're missing four hours a day. So it's like, we need a way to be on 24 hours because the ultimate goal actually wasn't just to be on 24 hours. The ultimate goal was to stream. And so you can't sign off if you're gonna stream. I mean, we ended up with a surplus of money and we ended up buying an Arrakis Systems computer system. Uh, we were able to sign on with the goal of never having to sign off again. KNSU was now broadcasting 24 hours a day with a shiny new automation computer. The rest of the equipment desperately needed upgrading. At every single DJ meeting, I remember the older guys would always say, hey, when you're on air, talk about something other than the play button in the, in the, uh, in the CD player not working or that the microphone is wire keeps on coming off, right? And, um, 
and but but and that would kind of work for a little bit, but then of course the CD player button, the play button wouldn't work, right? So you're about to introduce a song, you're talking about it, you play, and then it doesn't work. And the same thing with the microphone wire. So we were working with uh, a very old computer that felt like something from the 80s. Uh, we were dealing with a mixing board that while it worked, uh, it was. It felt like it was held together with duct tape at times. We found out that KNSU had like twelve thousand dollars in the account, so then we're like, okay, great. We we have some money that we can invest, reinvest in the station, and make some improvements in the equipment. Uh, but then we met with Dr. Stewart, and then he said, no, uh, you know, you can't use all that twelve thousand. And he explained the history that in the past students had brought that balance down to zero, and that it was um, we were gonna. That he didn't want to relive that when you know there's some kind of other emergency that came through. Uh, so then he allowed us uh, like three thousand dollars. I think so. It was like he said, like no, don't let the balance go below nine thousand. So we had uh, three thousand dollars to work with, and that was kind of enough to kind of at least work with the CD players. We got brand new CD players, uh, the microphones. It also allowed us an opportunity to um, buy the computer for the Studio B to do uh, student recordings because we were doing a lot more promotions uh, of different student organizations for their different events. Under new station management, KNSU changed focus. Like we were not out front, the most popular organization on campus. We were uh, kind of like that, that organization that was in the back closet there, like hidden far away that, that nobody really kind of, they knew it was there, but they didn't really, nobody really paid attention to. Uh, Lance provided that unique perspective, uh, sort of being the adult in the room with a bunch of college kids. And uh, he, he gave us some guidance along the way. And, and I think it was you know, through his guidance uh, that we were able to step out and, and be a little bit more professional while still having a lot of fun at the radio station. As KVFG did in the beginning, KNSU would work with athletics to increase exposure. One of the good, unique opportunities in broadcasting the, the, the football games and the basketball games was not only our opportunity for us to collaborate and support Nichols Athletics, uh, but then also um, I, kind of my vision on it was that it was going to open up some more doors for students to have like their own kind of sports show or something like that. We also got involved on the athletic side uh, by hosting some of the tailgate parties and, uh, and bringing some live music out to the tailgate party. So it was a way to, you know, provide entertainment for the student body, but also to get KNSU came out there. To raise awareness for the station, they did what they do best, music. We got involved with Student Programming Association. Uh, they were the ones, you know, this group of people decided who brought the major concerts to campus every semester. Uh, but I couldn't figure out why KNSU wasn't involved in that decision. So that was one of the first plays that we made. And then we started doing some campus-wide events. We did some events in the quad. Uh, we did an event, uh, you know, right outside our radio station where we brought music. And EdgeFest was the, our, our, our first attempt at, at a live concert event. We were able to get the stage out there and we had a local band, uh, which was the Josh Rowland Band. We had, um, we had, we gave, we had a bunch of giveaways. Uh, we did uh, some underwriting outreach with uh, Domino's Pizza to, and that was kind of part of our efforts to kind of slowly begin the underwriting uh, part. Underwriting was one way to increase funding, but there was another way that had not been used since KVFG first went on the air. It wasn't until sometime in the spring of 2002 that that idea came up, that the students uh, contribute each semester or each year uh, to a specific fee that covers uh, KNSU's uh, cost. We said, well, if there's $1, we get $1 from each student, that's $10,000. That's 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 you know that's great because then we can you know buy the equipment and then we can you know use it for other programs like going uh, the National Broadcasting Association's convention. Increasing awareness became a double-edged sword as outside influences wanted to change KNSU's format. Well, the SGA threatened to cut our funding because our format for radio station they felt like we weren't diverse enough and they wanted us to play top forty, be like B ninety seven, Q ninety three, whatever. Uh, so they formed a committee to basically change the format of radio station. I got nominated actually to be the head of the committee. And my only job of, as head of that committee was to call the next meeting. I never called another meeting and that was the end of that chapter. In 2005, the media committee hired Joshua McKnight 
as its first African-American station manager. Me, first black radio station manager there, nobody ever made me feel like I wasn't included. Nobody ever made me feel like I was different. Um, I will say there was like, I think about two DJs that did leave. I ended up finding that out during my time there that did not like that I became radio station manager. But for the most part, those friends and those people, they stuck by me and they helped me grow as a station manager. I wanted to bring everybody together and I wanted nothing but the better middle of KNSU. Group activities to bring the station staff and DJs together often turned into fun events involving the listeners. One of our big things to do during finals is that this is really where we're like a family. We would all come together and we would DJ all night in the rail station and study. And it literally would be studying, then we'd take a break, might go outside, smoke a cigarette, come back in, study. So, and so we'll take turns, like we, we actually get on air and DJ all night and play music. So we had that going on the whole time. And then we just got this bright idea at like three in the morning. Like, let's see if somebody will come down to the rail station and wrestle Ben Doolittle, who was actually a state champion wrestler from um, Covington High. His uh, DJ name is Rossett and Collins for a prize pack. And we used to have those prize packs filled with CDs, you know, K and shoe paraphernalia, all that. And not only did one come, but two came down to wrestle Ben and we moved the coffee table from the middle of the, the carpet and they wrestled Ben, Ben won, and they literally went back with a prize pack. All of the lighthearted fun came to an abrupt stop on 9-11. So from that morning, even before I got there, the DJs in the morning recognized that this was a time to not play music. We had to be talking about this. We had to bring bringing live uh, coverage. Uh, of it uh, when we weren't talking about it. So that's exactly what we did. There's an emergency, the FCC, there's gonna give like an emergency signal and then you automatically, you're supposed to, uh, you know, quit all, pro cut all programming and then go straight to, uh, go straight to uh, the WWL signal. So that way everybody gets the news. And uh, even though we canceled the shows for that morning, it did provide an opportunity for us too to provide some context. Because on, on the television that you had set up, and we were all watching the news. They were just showing pictures of the Pentagon and, and the Twin Towers, but they weren't giving enough. They weren't giving the background of why is this happening? What, what's going on? Like, what's the, what's the what's the background of all this? While I was skipping Dr. Antizzo's class, I had no idea that he had actually canceled his class for the same reason. And he actually came on the radio, and we in interviewed him. I got a call from KNSU asking me would I be willing to come in and talk about it on the air. And so I did. And uh, it went really well. I think we took some phone calls from people that wanted to ask some questions about the nature of what was going on. And we were on the air for quite a while. That, day. that time, it was sort of getting into the afternoon. And, and now we had time to digest everything that was going on. And uh, I'll never forget to this day, uh, of all the interviews I've done in my professional career, that, that's the one that still sticks with me. Uh, because I remember in talking to him, I remember when he stopped and finished uh, one of his thoughts as, this is the darkest day in American history. Other dark days were around the corner. We actually served a really good purpose to that on-campus community of people, of evacuees, who are staying at Stouffer Gym, and they played KNSU, you know, in Stouffer Gym, and we were able to deliver vital information about where they can go on campus that day to get free meals, where they can get clothing from the Red Cross. And I actually spoke about like how you can take a college radio station and a national, disa national disaster and become vital to a whole range of people who wouldn't even been on campus. They weren't even college students, but our radio station played a part in actually helping them get through daily life and activity. It made for a weird, period of time on campus because there were people who were in from uh, New Orleans universities that were just like finished. They were instead of not losing a semester, they were having their semester at, at Nichols. KNSU continued to grow relationships with campus organizations. Right off the bat, my first semester uh, as station manager, my staff and I, we really wanted to connect with the student body and put our name out there. So we partnered with the art department for their Shark After Dark, which is a pool party that they have at the Nichols Pool um, at the very beginning of the semester. So 
Um, I was able to help the art department book some local bands. I think I believe it was two bands. Looking back on it, it might have been a little awkward, you know, slash completely unnecessary to have a live band playing while people are just trying to like, you know, swim or hang around the pool. <laughs> that was the first of many events that we put on campus. Um, the next, over the next couple of years, we would do uh, concerts for tailgates. We would do a, um, we would partner with the SGA for their, you know, beginning of school uh, concert. And we always, always tried to, you know, book some local bands. We were always well represented from our sports organizations. We had a really good organization, uh, uh, really good relationship with athletics. Uh, we had um, multiple sports talk shows. Uh, the sports internship program pretty much ran through KNSU because a large portion of that internship was creating content on our air. And that really helped us kind of get out there. These relationships propelled the station into the spotlight, but it was still about the music. The format during my tenure, I would say, was eclectic alternative. I knew that at that time, hip hop was a very important genre of music to the student body um, and to people my age. So we definitely had a push to try to put as much um, hip hop out there. We had a couple of hip hop shows. Also at that time, uh, electronic music was, was really popular and taking off. Relationships with festivals brought tickets to KNSU listeners. When I first started, we didn't really have a lot of relationships with um, music venues or festivals. But, you know, by the time that I left, we were giving, you know, concert tickets away to Voodoo Fest, to Buku Fest in New Orleans. Uh, and then probably one of what I would like to consider my crowning achievements was we um, fostered a relationship with the, uh, the Hangout and the Bonnaroo Music Festivals. Um, and we were able to uh, not only secure media passes for um, some of our staff members to go, but we were able to give you know those uh, tickets away uh, to listeners. As Hurricane Isaac made its way to Louisiana, KNSU was there to help students prepare. The hurricane that hit in 2012, and uh, we had the president on the, our radio, I think, I believe it was Dr. Um, Dr. Stewart that interviewed the, pre the then president of the university at the time. And he talked about, you know, like what to expect from the hurricane, uh, you know, if you stay, what to expect, you know, that it might, things might not come back right away. Um, the precautions you need to take or, you know, like if you leave, you know, this is what you can expect coming back. Uh, that sort of thing, and like a lot of people ended up tuning into that to because you know it wasn't on any of the other you know uh, news outlets in the area, so they listened to Kane Shoe for that. We had a huge hurricane, which I stayed and <laughs> did reports <laughs> and then ran to shelter. That was kind of a really proud moment because we had never really been a source for information per se. Um, like that kind of hard news information, we had always been kind of more of a just music slash entertainment kind of programming. Station manager Richard Dubas started the most enduring annual concert. Alley After Dark, which was a huge concert we put on uh, with just local bands. And at first, like the first time we did Alley After Dark, it was literally in the alleyway. And we had a handful of people and we had like a person playing a couple little tunes and that was kind of it. The last time we had Alley After Dark, we had campus cafeteria involved. They helped us coordinate food. We had a full-fledged band. We had people who gave donations um, for like just different things you can give away. They did autographs and it was like a local, a fairly large local band. College radio, especially KNSU, was always a place where DJs could experiment and have fun. We always encouraged our DJs to seek out the format that most spoke to them. Uh, it was one of the reasons why I ran a video game show. There ain't no radio station on the planet 
that is playing Bloody Tears and then Mad World by Gary Jules from the Gears of War ad on top of that. Ain't no station in the world other than the college radio station would have that much freedom to do that. I was like, you know, interviewing DJs and someone wanted to do K-pop. And I had to listen to about two hours of K-pop, which is like Korean pop music. And I told my co-host who at the time, I said, I think I'd rather listen to, and there was this terrible song that came out called Blurred Lines by Robert Thicke. It was horrible. I said, I think I would rather listen to a two hour show where we just play Blurred Lines nonstop. Um, little did I know, the next day I had K to see you on, and I heard my co-host go, and today we're going to play Blurred Lines. And up next is Blurred Lines. And up next after that is Blurred Lines. And he played Blurred Lines for two hours. I would actually ask Matt Callahan. Uh, he has uh, more videos of us doing dumb stuff in the KNSU offices than anybody that I know. That man reported everything. Um, Stacy's mom has got it going on. 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 Stacy, can I come over after school? After school. We can hang out around by the pool. College radio is a place where mistakes are made, and often, they're embarrassing. Uh, when I was there, Guardians of the Galaxy came out, and they had that number one CD, and the first song of it was Hooked on a Feeling. So whenever the station would go down, you have to hit the CD, so that way there's still music. So every time the station went down, Hooked on a Feeling by the, the Hoff <laughs> would play. And even to this day, my adrenaline pumps, because I used to truck across campus to go fix the board, because I had, because no one else could figure it out. So every time I hear Hooked on a Feeling, my adrenaline pumps, and I just like go into bolt mode. <laughs> At the time, we were broadcasting live all the women's basketball games. And so there was a certain cue of a line that would happen when we would when they when they when the radio station would get queued to play our commercials and I would be off air. Whoever was running inside at the time, the station didn't, they missed the queue. And I just assumed they got the queue, which my fault for doing that. But I said live on air, oh my God, I have to take a and I only had like three minutes, like the, the timeouts. I think or I don't remember if it was, I don't remember if it was the time, I don't remember what it was, but I was like, oh my God, I only have a few minutes. I gotta take a and then when I never heard, hey, we're back on air and they gave me the countdown, I was like, are we live? And they were like, yeah, I'm so sorry. And I was like, I just said live on air. Oh my God, I gotta take a The equipment seemed more appropriate for a museum exhibit. KNSU has two purposes. The first being to give Nickel State students instruction in the broadcasting industry. The second being that KNSU serves as a museum to ancient broadcasting equipment. To, to aging IMAX, uh, we had a big, uh, external hard drive, like a five terabyte external hard drive that always seemed to fail. Uh, we had a Studio A that would always seem to go out, so we would have to record from Studio B sometimes, and even that wouldn't work, so we would just have dead air for hours on end. Uh, so that was uh, exciting. So we had that CD deck in case the station went down. That had to be from the 90s, because I've seen pictures of it still there. The board was probably from the 2000s, but the Mac looked like it was from 2008. <laughs> so it was this big old computer that would like freeze, and, uh, and then he had to hit the CD thing, and the board just had so many people, I think, tried to set the board. So you had like little stickers all over the place on it. There used to be a transmitter in the studio and the loud hum from the transmitter used to be, used to get into the broadcast. We are now inside Kane Issue's control room. Of course, this is where everything happens. Um, and you could hear it through the broadcast. Not only that, but we had the hard walls. We didn't have any soundproofing around the walls. So our voice would bounce off the walls and create an echo through the mics. They had a DJ booth and in the back of my DJ booth was like some old time sets and CDs and it was some outdated equipment. And we worked with what we had though. Like we, the DJs were awesome at just like, hey, go with the flow. 
put out good music, the people will listen. The legislature approved funds for a total renovation. KNSU had to go into the closet. We started renovations where it got a little chaotic. We had to pull everything out of KNSU and get rid of all the CDs that were on the CD wall. Um, and we stayed late that night cleaning cleaning everything. And after that, we were we were in the closet for a while. We had a cubicle like this big to do recordings on. You really had to like soundproof yourself. There's constant construction in the background. So you re we really had to like navigate with the DJs. It was such a small cramped room. We had the old soundboard uh, that you always had to fiddle with a little bit in order to get it to work. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was so cramped, but it didn't ever dampen anybody's spirit. We just kept Kane issue going. Once in the closet, the changes could begin. We knew big changes were coming. We were excited about them. Those big events happen, and then I got to see the change. I got to see the walls get painted to more of a professional, you know, white and continuous color. I got to see uh, us getting our new uh, liner equipment that we got to use to make liners whenever we needed to. I got to see the fact that we had a Studio A and Studio B, and... Uh, it was it was awesome and the fact that we could switch between studios and if we needed more room for to interview a band we could interview from both studios acadia music fest came to knsu with the proposal of a partnership from the beginning it was a great match uh i remember that being my first real i would say like fun uh concert experience was going to acadia music fest for uh you know knsu I went with Troy, I think another DJ. Um, Tyler was broadcasting us. And building that relationship with Acadia, we got to go on site at Acadia Music Fest and broadcast the live performances. And I remember that day because it had rained so much. It was like a swamp. And we were under this big giant tent uh, me and Aaron, who was station manager after me, and we had to sit through the rain and the mud and everything and set up everything. And it had to have been probably the hottest, humidest, muggiest type of broadcast that you could do, but it went off successfully. DJs loved the station so much. Some attempted marathon shows. They tried to beat a record and they were on air probably for 12 to 16 hours <laughs> constantly. Um, so that was that was pretty neat. I tuned in and I fell asleep, woke up, they were still on air. Like stayed on, it was nonstop. It was torture, it, it's not fun. Like <laughs> when people join, they probably think like, oh, it's gonna be so fun. I'm gonna be that young guy that does that. It's, it's like, it's, it's painful to be in that room with like two other people. You start disliking everything about <laughs> everyone around you. It's horrible. I think the longest they ever got was four days. They had a nonstop show for four days. And I think their rule was at least one person had to stay in. And so that's how they did bathrooms and food and everything like that. So they would do like day long shows, just trying to get to the record. I don't know if they ever did it or not though. As much as things change, six years later, Guardians of the Galaxy was still a sign of trouble at the station. We had a staff signal to know whenever the radio station was down, but it only worked if a DJ was in there. We had the Guardians of the Galaxy song, soundtrack. And the first song on that is Hooked on a Feeling. And so uh, anytime that like you would get in your car and you hear, you know, the ooga chaka, ooga. It's like, oh, gotta rush to the station because something's wrong with the, uh, the mega seg or something like that. And then in March of 2020. COVID was very like game changing, I would say. For someone who's been here, uh, who was here for a long time before it, and then it hit, it was, it, it changed everything. For a while, we didn't have shows at all. I think we completely shut it down. And I ended up working more with the radio, I mean, with the TV station. And we ended up doing a show called One LaFouche and we would post those episodes on the radio station afterwards. So we were still getting in touch with our community, 
But as far as that family dynamic, which thank God we have a group chat and we still communicate it, but the DJs really couldn't come in, which if you know our DJs, they like to just kind of lounge around. So telling them, come in for your show, do your show and get out, that was really tough. Usually it's a place where, you know, everybody goes in, does, uh, does their show, uh, people hang out, it's kind of lively. Because I came the semester before COVID, my first semester. And I remember we had a Christmas party in the station and it was like everybody came and it was so cool. And we never really got to do that again in the station when COVID started. But like now, like I know in last fall, I know the hurricane messed up a lot of things, but we were able to have like a Halloween party and a Thanksgiving party that a good bit of people did show up to. Um, so we're, we're slowly starting getting back into everyone coming together for, for stuff and we're just trying to have more stuff. But yeah, COVID was rough because we couldn't really get together and it, it made it hard. KNSU Radio with KNSU TV brought important information to the community during COVID. One Lafouche was hosted by Tommy Myers. Uh, we would bring different guests in. Um, I want to say they were like, we brought in uh, Big Mike. Uh, we had a few doctors on there, which was vital at the time where like everybody's trying to get their COVID information off of Facebook. And it's like, no, like we're bringing in actual specialists. Uh, really get in touch with the community. Like we really, uh, we showed how COVID was impacting business owners, how it was affecting citizens. Uh, we had Dr. Kuhn on the show. Uh, we had a congressman on the show. We had uh, Mr. Norby was on the show. Just real, it was, it was a great experience because it's like these are people that I would not have met, you know, outside of this show. And I was getting to meet people like this. I think it was once a week, every Wednesday we were doing the show. So it was a really cool experience. It was, I was literally getting a news level experience. I was in college outside of having to work in an actual newsroom. I was getting like a real world experience through the radio station and the TV station. COVID shut down many events on campus. KNSU helped make the Nichols Players Fall production possible. But we did do a recreation of Orson Welles' play War of the Worlds, which I wasn't in the play, but I was, I was really into the production side of it. I know I got a DJ who, uh, Paul Gagno, he was a voice actor. I got Paul to record a line and I was able to edit it to make it sound like it was coming out of a 1950s radio. Uh, we threw some 1950s music on there and we really created a commercial. I don't want to set the world on. KNSU Television and the Nichols Players on the air with War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. October 30th, 1938, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater put America into a panic with War of the Worlds. Thursday, October 29th, the Nichols Players will perform Orson Welles' radio version live in Mary and Aldenos Theatre on the campus of Nichols State University. War of the Worlds will also be streamed live on Facebook.com slash KNSU TV and replayed all Halloween weekend on KNSU 91.5 FM. And then that came out so well that Dr. Stewart asked us to do another commercial for the intermission. So now not only are we working with the Nichols players and streaming their event, but we were actually in the play. So we went from not being in it at all, except for being like workers to like, no, like we're part of the play now. The station found a way to hold their annual Alley After Dark concert. Um, we were trying to do an Alley After Dark. Now we were trying to pull this off in the middle of like COVID uh, going down, like the numbers in COVID going down. So we could have an audience, but it's not anything to compare to what we wanted it. We wanted to block off like that alley between the union and the station and it just didn't work. But uh, that's something where we worked together with the other mediums because uh, we had a broadcast in the Danos Theater and we had got the music. We hired the acts and everything like that. We set up scripts for uh, intermission and stuff like that. And then KNSU TV actually streamed it live on Facebook. What's unfortunate about it is that like we showed ourselves that we can do that out of necessity, not because we were trying to show off. Like we had to do it that way 
because of COVID. As if COVID wasn't enough, then along came Ida. The thing about Ida was that we were all so far away from each other and we spent so much time together just as a group of DJs, we spent mm -hmm. like every day together, most of us, like eating lunch, eating dinner, everything together. And so we were just spread apart and a lot of us didn't have service or Wi-Fi, so there was no way we could check on each other. And it was hard because you just had no idea where anybody was or if they were okay. People were stressed, people were mad, I get it. But it was a good place to have, like we had like that huge Discord group chat where it was like 30 people at a time. It was a good place to go for times like that, for COVID, Ida, whenever we can get service, because it's like, you know, not just your family or the people you're with, but another huge community of people that you could talk to. Honestly, I, I think we came out okay in it, in terms of as a station. Like once we got back to school and everything got back up to where we can do our shows and all that, I think we picked up okay. KNSU is a place where students learn, find family away from home, and share music. To many, it was the most important part of their Nichols experience. It, it has a special place for me. It really changed my life. That was a place that I found that I could belong to and then I kind of fit in. KNSU was probably everything to me when I was in college. Um, it was my job. It was my passion. It was my safe haven. The, the fondest memories uh, of college all include uh, times that I spent with, with DJs and staff at KNSU. You, you kind of have like a little home away from home on campus. Uh, KNSU was pretty much everything for me during college. I, it was my family. Like I loved the people there. Going into KNSU was like, oh wait, no, this is it. This is where I'm supposed to be. It was better than a fraternity to me, you know, because it was people that we all loved music. And what KNSU did for me more than anything was got me comfortable with myself. I mean, KNSU was our life. It helped mold you into what we would become and to the people we would become. KNSU has put me on a path in life going forward that I think really set me up for success. It, it's, it's my most favorite part of my time in college. Um, it, it's where I felt most at home. It's a good group of friends. Like that was probably the, my favorite times at Nickel State University were spent in 104 Talbot Hall. Well, it still has a place on my dial. It's a, um, a very fond memory from way back when. And uh, life is made of fond memories. I can't stop this feeling deep inside of me. Girl, you just don't realize what you do to me when you hold me in your arms so tight. You let me know. Everything's alright